Hi, it's The Wire. Wealthspinning.blogspot.com, a free site. Also, housing777.blogspot.com, a free site. It's the morning of April 17th, 2024. Nothing I say in this video should be construed as investment advice. I'm simply sharing what I'm considering, what I might pursue. Uh, quite frankly, my focus right now is on cryptocurrency, right? Um, smaller cryptos other than Bitcoin, right? I'm in Bitcoin, but just to understand my own personal investment portfolio has a lot of cryptocurrency in it. Um, some of the ideas I'm going to state here are not ideas that I'm invested in at the moment. But I believe it is very important for every investor to know the lay of the land, to be aware of what's happening around them, not just in the investments they've personally made, but in the investments that they're researching and thinking about, right? Sometimes these investments take several months, if not years, to make. Uh, so understand, if you're interested in cryptocurrency, um, I have a Substack page with a free tier. It's dwyer70905.substack.com. Give it a look, kick the tires, I'd love to have you there. Let's stay here though for this video. But first remember, I want you to do your own due diligence. The opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me also point out too, that I'm not here pretending to be a special authority. I'm just one investor talking to several others, sharing ideas. Um, I understand fully that my view is just one view on a planet of billions of people. Now, as I see it, the markets remain extremely overvalued, right? I feel that the public affect is off. I see politicians uh, and their henchmen at the Fed talking about the possibility of lower interest rates. Um, what I want folks to understand is that even though the stock market has been up uh, in, spur in spurts at times in the last few months, you should really expect a downturn. You shouldn't go by political statements from politicians or from Fed chairmen. You should instead go by the numbers. Let's look at some of the numbers. The Buffett indicator. Folks, understand that the Buffett indicator, which is the market cap of companies divided by the GDP, should equal roughly around 100%. The number here should be 100, right? Your gross domestic product should be reflected in the market cap. The market caps should not exceed the gross domestic product, right? Uh, the fraction market cap divided by GDP should be one. So the minute we get above 100%, you understand we're in overvalued territory. The Buffett indicator as of April 15th, 2024, this month, was 187.7. Right, folks, that's ridiculous. I don't have to hear from Joe Biden or I'm in California, Gavin Newsom about the economy. I can just look at the numbers and know it's hopelessly overvalued. I encourage everyone here listening to this video to Google for yourself, Buffett Indicator, right? Get 
the valuation as of today, you're going to find that the Buffett indicator, by historical standards, is hopelessly overvalued. Right? The reading shows that the stock market is headed for a reversion to the mean. It's going to drop considerably. The only question in my eyes is when, not if. Let's go further. The Schiller P.E. ratio. Just understand, the average historically is 17.11. Right? That's the average. If you're in st statistics and you want the halfway point, what we call the median, understand the median historically is 15.98. Right? Those are the historical numbers. The latest numbers I got on the current Schiller P.E. ratio is 33.61. Here again, like the Buffett indicator, the Schiller P.E. ratio shows that the market is hopelessly overvalued. Understand, too, the yield curve. And we're just plotting sovereign debt over time, right? We're comparing the two-year to the 30-year. Just understand the yield curve is still inverted. In a perfect world, if you're tying up your money for longer, they would reward you for that. They understand you would be taking on more risk. If I'm buying a 30-year, then I'm locked into the terms. If I keep it, for 30 years. So in a healthy economy, the person with the two-year would get a lower rate of interest than me with the 30-year, right? Because I'm suffering an opportunity cost. I'm giving up the opportunity to invest that capital elsewhere. I'd have it tied up in a bond. Just understand that as I make this video, the yield curve is still inverted. Let me make another point too. It's as the yield curve uninverts, that recessions typically happen. Right? The current yield curve is unsustainable. We have it in part because we're in an election year. Here in the United States, you need to view the current yield curve as artificial, not sustainable, not long term. Let me also point out too, and I know many people out there are waiting for rate cuts, right? They think that's going to save the economy. Understand that rate cuts can be reactionary. In other words, the people who benefit from rate cuts typically are the people who already have assets. Put differently, the rich get richer. The poor get poor comparatively. Let me also point out too that any cuts in rates by the Fed would have a short-term boost to the stock market. But it would be short-term at best. Right? Do you really want the stock market artificially boosted when the Buffett indicator is over 180? Folks, the answer is no. Right? Let's also mention something here that's anathema. That's going to sound completely ridiculous because we're in an artificial world right now. Sometimes higher rates are better. You want affordable housing. If you increase the rates, if you make mortgage rates higher, Folks, in my opinion, nothing is going to give you 
affordable housing faster than higher mortgage rates. Understand, real estate is a leveraged market. Most people buy their house subject to a mortgage. If you increase the borrowing costs, you're going to decrease the housing prices. If you want affordable housing, suppressing interest rates is not the way to go about it. We shouldn't be going down a road where interest rates are suppressed. And then, of course, the government comes up with some tax-intensive program to provide you with affordable housing, and you're paying for that program through your taxes, right? Then some politician wants to take credit for some completely inefficient affordable housing program that is focused on just one part of town, right? With, of course, politically connected developers. No, folks, I want the market to take care of the housing market. You want to drop housing prices all across the land, Right? With a group far bigger than political cronies. You do that by having the market digest the idea that the United States is $34 trillion in debt. Interest rates are going up. Fewer people can afford homes. What do you think is going to happen? Housing is going to come down, in my opinion. Now let's talk about the real state of the world because we've lost sight of it. Not only does America have record debt right now, but as Bob Marley put it, there's so much trouble in the world, right? So in the last few days, Iran has launched a drone attack against Israel. I don't know about you, but I don't have any confidence in Netanyahu. I think this is an older guy and younger people need to think about the ages of people. Who's going to be around when the world craters? Netanyahu is an older guy who isn't going to be around when the fallout from his actions actually hit the rest of us. Right? So just to understand, Iran launched a drone attack against Israel. Right? You would hope everyone gets around a table and does some negotiating. You would hope that this doesn't escalate, that no one's political career is built on the fact that they don't negotiate, that they're a tough guy, that they get what they want. You and I know that's not the world we live in. So let's just say the situation right now is precarious. Between Israel, Gaza, Iran. Let's go further. You have an emerging consensus now. By the way, in my opinion, this should have been the consensus from the first day. In my opinion, the bloodshed in the Ukraine has been completely unnecessary. Right? The art of war talks about how you win battles before they're fought. If you know you cannot beat your enemy, you want to surrender early. Well, that didn't happen. It's even worse than that. We subsidized the war here in the United States. Right? Our subsidies led to more bloodshed. Well, let me just say the emerging consensus is that Russia is winning the Ukraine war, which is in its final innings. Russia almost certainly is going to have the Ukraine acknowledge that Russia is entitled to some of the land that Russia has seized militarily. Right? Just to understand, this is the real world geopolitic, right? Frederick Nietzsche put it best. Might makes right. Right? Ukraine never had the military strength to fight off 
Russia. Right? Let me also point out, too, that, you know, we're beholden to NATO. This entire conflict could have been avoided. Why NATO was encroaching on Russia's border is anyone's guess. My real audience here is really a younger crowd that needs to question things, right? Learn lessons of history. Look at how completely mindless World War I was because these countries had treaties with other countries and went to war because of these military alliances, right? You should question our military alliances. You should openly question NATO, in my opinion. Right here, you had a lot of smiling politicians as NATO was getting closer and closer to Russia. Ukraine should never have danced with NATO. Right here in the Western Hemisphere, we have something called the Monroe Doctrine. If there's a group on the globe that should have figured out that having a foreign military alliance encroaching on your border could lead to blowback. One would have thought it would have been the United States of America. That hasn't been the case. We've had a leadership vacuum here. Right? So let's go further. Let's get past ad campaigns and let's talk about what's really happening here. Apple backs away from its EV development program after spending big money. Now we're hearing that Tesla is laying off 10% of its global workforce. Right? Understand too, folks, EVs are becoming commodities. I love the way a Tesla looks. They're no longer the only company making electric vehicles. Worse yet, it's China that's exporting EVs throughout Asia. Right? Companies other than Tesla. Understand, too, you have a problem here. And I believe it's a big problem. I can fall in love with an EV. But if EVs don't have the infrastructure that internal combustion engine cars have, well, why would I invest then? in the EV ecosystem. If when I get out in the middle of nowhere, there are no EV charging stations. Rather than just look at the brilliance of the product, the technological prowess of the product, don't you, the consumer, also have to look at the ecosystem? So what I want people to think about, and I have an eight-year-old, Right. Um, and I'll confess, I've ridden in planes that I'm sure are on autopilot for part of the trip. Right. But does the autopilot analogy in terms of autopilot on a plane in an empty sky really match up with the idea of a autonomous driving vehicle? in downtown San Francisco or in midtown Manhattan where it's crowded, where you're dealing with not just cars suddenly jumping in front of your car, but pedestrians crossing the street on red lights. You're dealing with not a plane in the air, but you're dealing with a car that drives better than the average driver. I have no doubt about that. But am I going to take my eight-year-old in a robo-taxi that doesn't have a driver anytime soon? 
No, I'm not. Right? Understand, this is evolving technology. Are you going to take your newborn? are valued for their autonomous vehicle technology, right? I would say that that valuation is at risk of the next big act. San Francisco is a hilly city. You're going up and down. You're dealing with pedestrians. You're dealing with cable cars. You're dealing with buses. You're dealing with urban congestion. At least you were before this commercial real estate market trouble. Right? Well, just understand the autonomous vehicles at this stage, at this time, were not up to the job. They had to pull many of them. Google that story. So, let me just say, EVs, I think that's a work in progress. I don't think we know fully the lay of the land. I don't think we know the rate of expansion of that market. Let me point out, too, that one of the problems with EVs are the energy demands of other emerging technologies, right? Cryptocurrency, AI, artificial intelligence. So what I want folks to do here is to just think about the AI build out. The head of Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman, um, gave a recent interview where he talked about how globally you're having all these digital data centers where these AI servers are pop up all around the globe. Folks, it's a massive build out, right? Massive. I want people to realize that even the phrase AI is going to be dated soon. Just like the phrase high tech from the early 80s quickly became dated, right? Because technology was technology. All AI is, is the next step up in energy intensive computing. Right? Let me say this too. I want folks to think about hip hop music back in the 80s. Understand, you had pioneers like New York City DJ Marley Mall. And these are the kind of names we need to know because they're relevant today. And what Marley Marl would do is he would take from records certain melodies. He would lift them. He would change the tone. He would sync them to different beats. Right? In other words, he would borrow, take, whatever word you want to use, the work of prior artists, and he would then convert that work into a collage that sounded great, that sounded just different enough from the original so that he would not be sued. Now understand, this has been how hip-hop has been for decades. You need to view AI as just the next step in that. What AI allows you to do is to grab, you know, look at the work from artists in the past. Change that work slightly. Right? Digitally erase parts of it. Have renderings 
where you are looking at the artist's view of a mountain range and you change it just enough, borrowing from the lighting, the angle, so that you can then put it in a background digitally. This background here today is a digital background, right? Just understand that AI is allowing us to pull from the work of others, right? When we talk about AI writing articles, what's really happening is AI is looking at other people's articles. They're figuring out the word usage. What's the verb? What's the adjective? What's the subject? Then they're structuring it so it looks like an original work. But it's actually, we'll use the word loosely, inspired by the work of others. Right? The computer is figuring out word sequences. Then they're tweaking it just slightly. Just like Marley Mall tweaked tunes, tweaked melodies. Right? To come up with music that was not created by a band. AI, of course, is coming up with now video that was not created by a videographer. Right, so that's where we are in the world. And understand, AI is extremely energy intensive. So here, what I want people to do is to think about AI for a moment. Right? Think about who's well positioned. I believe due to the heavy energy use of AI, of EVs, right? People are charging their electric vehicle, folks. It takes time to do so. It's not like filling up an internal combustion engine car. They're at the charger for a period of time. Right, cryptocurrency, let's just say um, crypto has its holy grail moment. And I need for people to understand that's not the happening. The happening is minor or halving, whatever word you want to use, depending on how long you've been in crypto. Right, the halving isn't anything but a pimple on the big moment for crypto. It's going to be when one of these major economies, Germany perhaps, the United Kingdom, which of course depleted its gold reserves, perhaps, the United States of America, it's going to be when one of these big economies actually formally acknowledges that they have a Bitcoin reserve. Or they have a reserve of another crypto, Ethereum, right? Or something else. But just understand, that's going to be your holy grail moment, right? Make no mistake, this is going to be an extremely bullish year, in my opinion, for Bitcoin and other cryptos, right? I told you the real game are the smaller cryptos. Those are the ones that are going to really shine. Just like you know, in the real world, you know, Microsoft is well positioned in AI, but Microsoft can only grow by so much. Right? Smaller upstart companies can grow by several times what Microsoft can grow by. Right? NVIDIA, same thing. Because understand, at a certain size, it's just the law of large numbers. It's harder to get bigger. You're also going to have regulatory blowback. Right? So I need for folks to realize we're still in the early innings in crypto, even with spot Bitcoin ETFs being approved by the SEC. Right? Well, my point to you is crypto, AI, even folks, think about the electrical grid. Think about the energy demands. These digital data centers. Just think about a building with server after server after server. Think about how much electricity that uses. Understand, the game has changed so much 
that it was just a year ago we were hearing about how crypto used so much energy. Right, shouldn't we regulate crypto because of its energy usage? Folks, AI uses much more, <laughs> uses much more energy than cryptocurrency. Right now, the question has changed. It's how do we update the energy grid to handle all these energy needs? Isn't that where we are now? So what I want folks to do is to realize that we're going to have to go nuclear. Right? Understand there's this concept of peak oil. Who knows if we're at peak oil? Right? But I can tell you that countries like Saudi Arabia are trying to diversify away from oil. Right? So you will notice that Saudi Arabia is hosting a lot of boxing matches these days. Right? Go online. Look up Saudi Arabia. You're going to find out that they're trying to make Saudi Arabia more tourist friendly. Right? Places like Dubai are heavily into cryptocurrency. Right? They're moving away from oil. Right? The United Arab Emirates. They're, they're moving away from oil. Right? Given the energy needs, given the idea of peak oil, right? Given, you know, the coming depletion of the Permian Basin here in the United States, folks need to realize that we have to go nuclear. Some of the plays that have evolved because of our energy needs, AI, EV, crypto, are nuclear. So modular nuclear companies, companies that can build nuclear reactors in a modular way that are smaller, you need to look at. Also, the lifeblood, mining-wise, for nuclear energy. Uranium, you need to look at. So here, let's just name some companies. I'm still in Exxon, XOM. I still believe in natural gas. Understand, folks, natural gas is part of the energy used for the electricity in EVs. So I'm still into EQT, for example. Let's name some other companies. Modular Nuclear Reactors, BWXT, right? That's the symbol. Look it up. BWXT. In terms of uranium, consider Cameco, CCJ. Uh, in fact, these are just things I'm looking at. You do what you want. You do your own due diligence. Right? Um, Sprott Physical Uranium. SRUUF. Again, that's SRUUF. The Sprott Uranium Miners ETF, that's U-R-N-M, again, U-R-N-M. Let's talk about other ways to play AI. Now, I do believe that the Goliaths have an advantage that's going to be hard for anybody to overcome right now. So you heard me mention Microsoft. Let me mention, and that's M-S-F-T. Let me mention Google. G-O-O-G, let me mention Amazon, A-M-Z-N, let's mention an ETF that's uh, bullish for Amazon, um, A-M-Z-U, right? Let's mention a well-positioned company that's investing in AI in Asia, and that's Alibaba, the symbol is B-A-B-A, -B -A. We mentioned servers earlier. Understand Dell is well positioned. That's D-E-L-L. -L. Also, I know it's richly priced, but S-M-C-I, give that stock a look. Um, I think that as the market craters, we're going to pivot towards certain areas for which there is very high demand. Right? I believe energy is going to be in play. You want to get ahead 
of the nuclear train. Right? I believe AI is going to be in play. These large language models, they take a lot of capital. Understand, you have these newer startups and they're being gobbled up by the Amazons of the world. Right? So you want to be with we'll call it big tech in terms of this AI rollout, right? Open AI, Amazon, excuse me, Microsoft already has a big ownership interest in that company, right? It's very hard to compete with the big boys in this nascent industry. Let me also say too, NVIDIA is very richly priced, but they're extremely well positioned, at least for the next 12 months. But you want to be thinking about an NVIDIA successor, right? Because like Tesla in the EV space, other companies, right? Lee Auto, LI is the symbol. Other companies are going to emerge. Just understand, you have competition in the chip space right now. AMD, give it a look, right? Huge margin, part of the market. You understand NVIDIA can only be the big dog in town, unchallenged for only so long. Also understand too, some of these other big tech companies are developing their own chips. There's going to be disintermediation in the space, right? I think AMD is well positioned in that space. Those are my thoughts. Um, we'll just stick to these investment ideas, right? The idea of energy, nuclear energy, the idea of artificial intelligence, uh, I believe those two are going to be big survivors in the coming fallout. I believe right now we're in the melt-up before the crash, right? Take a look at 1999. Take a look at how that ultimately turned out. Just understand that before you have these market meltdowns, you sometimes have melt-ups, right? But understand with a still inverted yield curve, this market is not healthy. Those are my views. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.